Welcome to the KPMG LinkedIn Live Banking Industry Outlook, hosted by Peter Torrenti, National Sector Leader of the KPMG Banking and Capital Markets Practice. We are delighted to have with us today, Tom Michaud, President and CEO of KBW. KBW, a subsidiary of Stiefel Financial, is an investment bank focused on the financial services sector. KBW's highly regarded bank research team has the broadest coverage of the banking industry on Wall Street, covering not only the nation's largest banks, but most of the leading regional banks as well. Tom, welcome. It's hard to believe we're already almost two weeks into the new year, and certainly uh, since last time we met, as we look back to third quarter, seems like a lot has uh, has been resolved. We have a, a vaccine, we have another round of stimulus, we have uh, election results. Uh, and while there's been a lot that has been resolved, as we speak to our clients, certainly uh, there's some uncertainty uh, as you look out into 2021. Um, with earnings season just about to kick off, uh, Really love to get your views on what you're seeing and expecting for the fourth quarter uh, earnings. And as you look out for the rest of 21 and into 2022, uh, what you think the key themes will be. Well, great. Good, good to be with you too, Peter. And thank you for having me back. Uh, we think the fourth quarter is going to be an important transition quarter for really the three main, main themes that have been driving the fundamental results for the banking industry. The first theme is the credit recovery story. Uh, the second theme is the negative operating leverage that's currently present in the industry. And the third theme is the capital management and capital return story that's been around the industry. Now, there are a lot of external factors that I hope we get a chance to talk about later, like the economy, consolidation, the political environment, uh, and the movement towards fintech. Those are all really important factors as well. But as far as the fundamental uh, fundamentals go, uh, we think the third quarter, uh, in terms of profitability on a year-over-year -year basis, is going to show a decline of about 8% in terms of earnings per share, uh, which is really being driven by the pandemic, by a tougher revenue environment and higher provisions. But when you get into the three pieces that I mentioned, uh, number one, on the credit recovery story, uh, provisions have been trending lower than the greatest fears earlier in 2020. And we think that provisions and net charge-offs are gonna be about the same to maybe a tiny bit higher than they were in the quarter. But we also believe that the level that they're operating at are still pretty low. And so we believe that observers of the industry and investors and management teams uh, are gonna be pretty optimistic about where we are on the provisioning and on the credit cycle. Uh, as far as non-performing assets, uh, the view right now is that non-performers are gonna peak at a level well below the worst fears that we had in the spring of, of 2020. So, so we believe that the credit recovery story is still gonna be in place in the fourth quarter and that the worst case scenario is still off the table with where we are today in the industry. As far as negative operating leverage, that has really been the story of the year for the industry of last year for the industry in 2020 because of the tough revenue environment. And that's been for two major reasons. Uh, reason number one has been there's been tremendous margin pressure. The industry in the third quarter had eight basis points of net interest margin degradation. Uh, we believe it's going to be three basis points in the fourth quarter, so still a headwind but less of a headwind. And again, that's the trend as we get towards recovery in 2021. Um, and then as far as loan growth goes, we believe that there's really no organic loan growth throughout the industry. The growth we're seeing now is a lot of the government stimulus programs, especially in the triple P programs, but there really is not a, a lot of organic loan growth. So that's created somewhat of a revenue headwind, especially for the banks that don't have a lot of non-interest income or investment banking uh, subsidiaries. On the theme of capital management, first of all, what, one of the things that we're just thrilled about and we're not really surprised about is the dividend cover. Remember, in the third quarter, the banks, 99% of the banks in a key bank index covered their dividend in the third quarter. In the second quarter, there have been tremendous calls for the banks to do like Europe had done 
and to suspend dividend payments. So we think that the underlying profitability industry remains strong and that from a capital management story, we believe that by and large, the industry's dividends are safe. We also on December 18th of, uh, of last year, got the news from the Fed that the DFAS banks were gonna be eligible to start repurchasing shares with some caveats. That happened about six months faster than we expected. And we think it's quite bullish. And so we think that you are going to see a ramping of share repurchase. Uh, you've already seen several announcements. It's actually so strong that some of the largest banks, we believe that if you look through the end of 2022, could repurchase as much as their market cap uh, as 20% of their market cap uh, from the December 18th um, announcement. So we think the capital management story will be proven out here in the fourth quarter. And so these three trends will roll into 2021. And I think it'll still, it'll, it, what will be different is we expect earnings per share and earnings to begin to grow because in 2021, uh, we believe that provisions will decline a great deal. Uh, we also think that the trend in 2021 will be reserve releases. And, and we think that 2020 was the year of the provision. 2021 is going to be the year of, of reserve releases. And you'll probably still see net charge-offs grow as we go into 2021. But that will turn out to be a better earnings year for the industry. Um, and also, we believe that the negative operating leverage that's in the industry today will probably continue to ease as 2021 evolves and we get into December. And by the end of the year, we think we'll reach a turning point, especially with the current steepness of the yield curve that's come back. And the overall view is that we think that 2022 is going to be a year that's more typical in what we expect the, the fundamentals of profitability for the industry to look at. So Peter, that was a long answer. Uh, I wanted to touch upon a lot of the themes so we can kind of set up the rest of our discussion. But that's what we think about for the fourth quarter. I think it's going to be a solid quarter. I think it's going to be viewed as a gateway to 2021. And I think the credit recovery story is still intact. The operating le negative operating leverage environment is still here, but getting less so. And the capital management return story is on its way. Yeah, that's great, Tom. I, and when you take all of that into account, and bank stocks have done relatively well in the, the uh, recent uh, past here over the last couple of weeks, but still lagging the the overall market. And why do you think that's so? And how would you see that playing out for the rest of the year? Sure. Um, I think what's remarkable is that the at the first signs of the pandemic and the recession, investors got extraordinarily cautious on the banks. And it was really remarkable with the lows that we hit on March 23rd. And then in September 20. Third, we hit another low, um, not a new low. The low for the year was in March, but then we hit a, a more recent low in September. And, and there were lots of concerns about the economy at that time. As the economy has continued to improve steadily, and uh, KBW has a restoration index where our index suggests that we will recover all the pre-pandemic economic activity by the third quarter of 2021. Um, so we believe that, uh, that the discount that is in the, the bank stocks today is still too wide on a relative basis. Uh, if you look at a, all the relative measures to history with the banks, we're still 20 to 25% cheap relative to historical relative averages. On a nominal basis, we've, we're closer to where we've traded, uh, but also the stock market's at an all-time high. And like you said, the bank stocks have been left behind. So, so we think as, these, as, as the incremental trends break positive, okay, meaning the 10 year is a little bit higher than we thought it was gonna be. And as we continue to see, as we start to see reserve releases later in 2021, as a negative operating leverage continues to wane, we think that street estimates are probably too low for earnings. Uh, the KBW estimates are actually higher than the typical bank analyst estimates. Uh, and it could cause an increase as much as 5 to 10% in street estimates and banks. So as earnings estimates go higher, as the fundamentals play out, we think you could see these stocks continue to outperform. And we rate the biggest banks in the nation outperform. We like the sector. 
Um, and then the last piece I'll say is the technical flows could be overwhelming. So after President Trump was elected president to the peak, $24 billion flowed into financial specific ETFs. By the time his reelection uh, came up, 90% of that money had flowed back out. So you'd had basically 24 billion come in, you had 21.7 billion go out. Uh, since the election, since uh, President-elect Biden was elected, $5 billion have flowed back in. So about a quarter of the boost that we had due to the prior presidential election. Now I'm giving these numbers just to give scale, which is that the whole growth versus value trade and the whole view that value stocks could come back well, uh, are really, I think, could cause a lot of passive flows in the favor of these bank stocks. So we're optimistic for what 2021 is gonna bring for the stocks. Tom, when you think about those comments about the, the US uh, bank stocks um, and you think about the operating environment in Europe, how would you compare the, the US to the European banks and, and how do you think that'll well, play out? So the American banks have been leading the global banking industry. Um, and I think that really the history books as they go back and they see the speed at which the Dodd-Frank reforms happened after the last crisis, the degree to which capital and liquidity were, were focused upon really set the industry up well for when the next crisis happened like it did with the global pandemic. So, so I would give high marks for that. And I think that's a lot of the driver for why the American banking industry in 2022, where we think is gonna be the first typical post-pandemic year, that, that these banks are gonna earn about 14% on tangible common equity. The European banks, only about 20% of them, we believe will earn 10% on tangible common equity in 2022. So the profitability dynamic is very different. And while some of it, I think, is just because the reforms happen sooner in, in the United States versus Europe, the other part is negative interest rates. The banking industry was not built to operate in a negative interest rate environment. And that has really crushed net interest margins in Europe and has caused that sector to be less profitable. Uh, that being said, we're recommending the stocks because while the American banks trade at 1.6 times tangible book, the European banks trade at 0.6 or 0.5 times tangible book. And we believe that a recovery is underway. They do have enough capital. Uh, they are beginning expense sa savings programs. You know, our price targets aren't for them to get to 1.6 times tangible books like in the United States, but we do think that they could do better than where they are today. But I think the main drivers are Negative interest rates continue to harm the, the fundamentals of the European banks. And also uh, the regulatory reforms were swifter uh, and I think frankly more efficient for the industry in the United States. And Tom, do you think that from a consolidation standpoint that we'll see consolidation uh, within the industry in Europe and or do you think there are buying opportunities for uh, US banks overseas? So I, I think, number one, we are going, we have seen European bank consolidation. I think Spain and Italy are two countries, for example, that, that you, you've seen it and it's right for more. Uh, interestingly, we've been reading the regulatory comments on consolidation and, and how the pathway is being built for that to happen, because really pre-crisis there had not been much. So. I, I, I translate and our analysts translate the comments from the regulatory bodies as supportive of consolidation as a way to take out expenses to improve the profitability of the industry in Europe. Uh, so I think that's, that's number one. Number two is uh, I would be somewhat surprised if an American bank did a big deal in Europe, not to say it's impossible, I think the American banks can probably uh, achieve their goals by hiring talent and opening offices. Most of them are already there. I could see them expanding uh, their presence, uh, or I could also see a continuation of European banks uh, selling U.S. subsidiaries 
like BBVA did the PNC, uh, and see American banks buying uh, uh, American subsidiaries of foreign banks. But I, I don't see a very large acquisition of an American bank to get to get physical presence, because also too there's an incredible digital dynamic and fintech dynamic that's underway that I, I think the American banks probably feel that they can access the customers they want in means that may not require them to buy by their competitors. Yeah. And Tom, you, you touched on a little bit of the U.S. environment there, maybe turning our, our focus back to the, the U.S. M&A environment. Obviously, a number of deals have uh, been announced uh, since we last talked in the third quarter. Uh, and just maybe uh, your outlook for the rest of 2021 and maybe uh, you mentioned fintech, but just the role you see of uh, fintech in that and uh, maybe even big tech, given where some of the, the valuations are. Sure. What, what I think is re one of the things that's been a remarkable observation during this pandemic has been the rapid acceleration of the movement towards digital engagement by financial institutions. I mean, you see it all over the stock market, the work from home stocks. Uh, you see the growth that, that's been occurring. Uh, when we go through bank results and speak with bank management teams, you're seeing digital engagement up 20 plus percent at, at the banks that have heavy investments in these areas. It's probably one of the fastest growing parts of their banks. And what it's done is, is I think it's changed the whole dynamic around need for branches, for example. And, and so we're seeing a lot of cost savings initiatives underway, which is, which is part of the response to the negative operating environment I spoke about earlier. And 80% of those cost savings initiatives include branch close, closures. And that's because there's a growing confidence that, that financial institutions and banks can engage with their clients more on a digital format, so framework. So you take that and you marry it with the fact that the strata of the industry now is such that the biggest banks are more profitable than the smaller banks, which suggests that scale is working. And typically the bigger banks have more diversified revenue streams, which means they're, 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 that the negative operating leverage headwind hits them less. So you've got the benefits of scale combined with the need for more digital engagement because that's just the requirement now is causing the fuel for consolidation. So we've seen a couple of very big deals happen recently. Um, and, and our expectation is you're gonna see more. The industry was caught consolidating pre-pandemic. We think we're gonna get right back on it again now and we are, have already started. But what's gonna be different this time is I expect to see some of the nation's biggest banks involved in this consolidation, not the big four, but when you get below the big four, because most of them can't because of the deposit cap. But when you get below the big four, I, I think that the end game is on for which of the big banks want to be the national consumer players. And I think scale is needed to make this investment um, uh, as well as to drive profitability. Pre-pandemic, I think banks felt that their major competitors were across the street and they were other banks. Today, I think banks believe that technology companies are more of their competitors than they were pre-COVID. And so I think that, that that's, it's a little bit of an offensive and a defensive move on their part, and I expect to see more of it. Yeah, in interesting comments, Tom. Maybe uh, wrap up with any, uh, any final comments you have sort of looking forward, new administration, whether it's regulatory, tax, need for more stimulus, uh, any, any final comments as you kind of look out over the next 12 months? Yeah, look, I, the, the biggest threat to the banking industry uh, is credit. And, and if we go through a deep credit cycle, that's bad. And I think, that, again, like I said earlier, that was driving investor concerns uh, last year in the stocks. To the extent that we continue to get stimulus, uh, that's going to help the banking industry. Um, I also believe that the problem sectors that we've all been talking about, hospitality, travel, they're going to remain so. I don't think there's any magic fix for those sectors. And I think the banks have already provided a lot of money against those sectors. So those will probably still remain so. But stimulus is a real positive for the banks. Uh, getting a little bit of inflation concerns and a steeper yield curve is a big positive for the banks. The further away we get from zero interest rates, 
uh, the better for the industry, as long as it doesn't rapidly move or get out of control on, on, on the economy. But to the extent we get a little steady pickup in this 10-year yield, that's been a positive for the, for the banks. Uh, as far as uh, legislation goes, we still don't believe that this new Congress is going to focus on a big banking bill. We think that there are other priorities, such as in the technology sector, where you're more likely to see legislation. Uh, we still are waiting to hear who the president-elect's nominees are going to be for the CFPB and, and, and also some of the other regulatory seats. And to the extent that there's a more aggressive or progressive approach there, that could have an impact on the industry. Uh, and then lastly, there's been talk that we'll see an infrastructure bill in the new Congress. And there's been talk that that bill could be paid for with the Biden corporate tax plan. And to the extent that corporate taxes go up uh, in America, that will probably hit the banking industry the hardest. Uh, the banking industry was one of the biggest beneficiaries of tax reform in the Trump administration. And that could put a, a, a dent into profitability for the banks and it's worth watching. And we don't have any of that in our earnings estimates or outlook at the moment. So that's something that's, uh, that's worth watching. But by and large, uh, steps that are taken to help the economy are going to be good for the banking industry. And, and I think allow the banking industry to continue to evolve and, and, and be a productive part of the recovery as well. Tom, thank you very much. Thanks for sharing your insights with us. Great, great perspectives. And I'm sure there'll be a lot that happens between now and the end of March. Uh, but look forward to talking to you again uh, in the first quarter. Peter, great to be with you. Have a great year.